And we're joined by Kenny Dillingham, head coach of the Arizona State Sun Devils. Uh, Kenny, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you having me. All right, so you are now 33 years old. Do you realize that you are a head coach in college football at 33? Well, well, sorry, at 31 years old. So, like, take us back. At, at what point in time were you? Did you figure out this is what I want to do? So I was uh, a senior in high school, going into my senior year, and I tore my tore my ACL. Tried to play without it. I was already unathletic. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, and my coach was like, why don't you just start coaching? Charlie Regal is now a special teams coordinator. And then I started coaching. I just fell in love with the impact you could make. And then I love competing. So the combination of you can make an impact on people uh, outside and then the competition, it's a chess match combined with relationships, which is such an interesting part of the sport. So I just fell in love and thought I could do it. So then you end up as a GA. You were a GA here at Arizona State. You went to Memphis. You've been to Florida, Florida State, uh, Oregon, and then back here. What has that journey kind of taught you along the way? I think every place you learn something new. So, like, when I left Memphis and went to Auburn, I got to learn, you know, small-town SEC ball. Yeah. I got to learn what it's like for a, a town to all of a sudden triple in size on yeah. game day and everybody care about one thing and it be the show and the thing. When I went to Florida State, a little bit bigger town, very similar, but we took it over when it was down. So I got to see a fan base that was like hungry for how do we get it back yeah. and want it. And then when I got to Oregon, and so we had to use the portal there. When I got to Oregon, I got to see you know, a place that was flourishing, Yeah. you know, and, and that was already winning and how do you take it to the next level in a place that, you know, was revolutionary in the NIL world. So I got to see a place that needed to utilize the portal and needed to utilize the new way, way of college football at Florida State and then a place that understood how NIL worked with Nike and Phil Knight and all that stuff and kind of really get a good beat on kind of the changing of the guard in college football. So do you believe that you being young – is an advantage in terms of recruiting, being ready for the all the changes that are that are happening with NIL. Like you, like you said, you've been around that. Do you think your youth is helping you in that area? Uh, I mean, people could say youth. I think just my. I'm not stubborn. I don't think I don't whether I'm 32, 33, or there's a 55 year old coach, 65 year old coach. You just have to be willing to adapt, and it's no different than business. It's no. Di I, I compare football and college athletics to a technology company. Technology doubles and triples yearly, yeah. and it changes constantly. You may use uh, MapQuest one day. And if I used MapQuest today and not Google Maps, people are going to look at me funny. Yeah. Or Waze, yeah. right? I'm probably still behind not using Waze. And so I, that's what college athletics is, is it's constantly changing. So I, whether you're young or old, you got to be willing to adapt. Uh, and then you got to know your strengths. Like my strengths is I can relate to kids and I understand what they're like. My weaknesses is i got to create boundaries because I am closer in age. So I earn that respect and that trust with the guys. So there's strengths and weaknesses to, I think, everybody. You just got to be willing to adapt. Yeah, and, and before you came down here, you were with another young head coach in Dan in Dan Lanning. What what kinds of things did you learn when you were at Oregon? Because you said that you got a chance to see the NIL there. You got a chance to see a program that was already doing really well. What kind of things did you learn from Dan and also being in Eugene? Yeah, the recruiting piece. Uh, I think Dan is. I mean, his drive and his commitment to that yeah. in terms of what he wants to do because, I mean, he's one of the best defensive coordinators in college football. And to put that aside and say, no, this is what wins. Yeah. Talent wins. Players win. And so to see somebody that I knew and trusted and had so much just belief in him as a coordinator to say, no, 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 no. My job is different now. Yeah really gave me that belief that, okay, this is the path, is we got to get the players in here. Uh, from the town, the town there is unbelievable. They're passionate. I mean, I said it when I was there, and I got some heat for it, but it's still true. It's one of the college towns on the West Coast that can win a national championship there, and that's still the same place. There's not a lot of college towns on the West Coast. Yeah. That's an accurate statement. There's other teams that can win it out here. For sure. But to have that college atmosphere at the same place, it makes Eugene special, you know, west of Texas. And when you've been an offensive coordinator, at what point – well, I noticed in my playing career that there were some offensive coordinators that tried to fit 
the fit players to their system. And I've noticed that you, throughout your career, have actually done the opposite, which has had tremendous success. Where did you learn that philosophy from, and how has that been successful for you? I would say growing up, I mean, I coached youth football about 15 minutes from here, yeah. high school football. You don't get to pick your guys. You get them and you adapt. Yeah. So I think those experiences, having to just take whoever you have and put them in the best position to succeed. And then you can't be scared to do things that are not normal. You can't be scared to do something and worry about what somebody's gonna say about you. You have to just do what you think is best and have belief and passion about it. So I would say my history, just a high school coach, coaching sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. I coached youth dodgeball out here. All of that goes into the philosophy that you do what it takes to, to try to win. And that's the goal. Uh, and <laughs> so you are, you know, an Arizona guy, and I remember when you were interviewing for the Arizona State job, and Ben, and your name started to come up. The the pat, and then when you finally got got the job, the passion in which you talked about Arizona State, it seemed like it really mattered to you. So, like, when did Arizona State like get into your bones? Yeah, I mean, I grew up coming to games. So I grew up 15 minutes from here, the high school I coached at, and I went to 20 minutes from here. I went here, my wife went here, my brother-in-law went here, my sister went here, my other brother went here, my father-in-law went here. So like, I grew up, I came to games with my dad, like this was the parking lot that I grew up in. Yeah. So it was always where I wanted to be. Like I was talking to a former player who's now starting to get into coaching, and we do little, fire, little chats uh, in fall camp about like goals for them and goals yeah. for the staff. And I remember I was in Memphis and they said, okay, well coach, what are your goals? I said, I want to be the head coach at Arizona State. I was at Florida State with Jordan Travis and Mackenzie Milton. They said, what's your dream job? I want to be the head coach at Arizona State. And people look at me like, why Arizona State? And I'm like, cause it it's means more than just football here. Yeah. I have family here, I grew up here. I, 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 I used to watch it. Yeah. That means more to me. Yeah. So I, it's just something that I've always wanted to, to have the opportunity to do. See, there's a few coaches that have said, uh, you, you know, like not, not not to name any names. Oh, I'm so – well, I, actually, every coach when they get to a school, <laughs> they, they have the press conference. They're like, yo, I'm so excited to be here. I love it here and all of those things. But you really mean it. And this is your dream job. So – when, when you were at Oregon and then you start realizing, whether it's through your agent or whoever con contacted you, oh my God, this might be a possibility. What was that part of the, well, where, where was that in the timeline? And how was that mentally still trying to focus on, you know, that job, but still being, oh my God, my dream is within reach. I mean, to be honest, it just motivated me more Mm -hmm. I, I literally, I think the job opened up week three of the season. Yeah. You know, everybody used to say, you know, there's some people who thought, oh, at the end of the year I wasn't focused at Oregon. Like, that still sh shows up. And I'm like, man, well, the job opened week three. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what happened to the other weeks? Yeah, exactly. And it was because when that job opened, it was like, man, if I just do the best I can do for eight weeks, I can force them to hire me. If I make this the best offense that people can see, they're, they're not going to have a choice. So I poured everything I had into that football team because I knew the, it wasn't going and being political. It was scoring and winning. Yeah. That was my only avenue. So I just poured, I doubled down on everything I was doing at Oregon at the time to say, okay, this is my shot. This is it. Yeah, and, you know, it's like the Eminem, you, you only get one shot because you never know because if they had hired somebody else and he does a great job, your dream job ain't open for him. That's a hundred. Very long, a very long time. So was, was that a little bit of pressure on, your, on yourself knowing that, man, like, like I see my dream and it's in with, with, within reach and I'm going to force them to make it happen? Yeah. I mean, I've always – kind of put that pressure on myself since I started getting in. I always have a saying, it's not somebody's job to hire you. Yeah. Like, every, oh, why didn't I get hired here? Somebody should have hired me. Or there's an excuse for why I didn't get this job. You hear it all the time. I was going to do blank. Yeah. That's the first sign of an excuse. It's like when I got into coaching, somebody told me way back then, it's nobody's job to hire you. It's your job to force them to. Mm. And I have taken that mindset from when I was 22 years old to say, okay, I'm in the building now. I'm getting somebody's coffee at Arizona State. I'm the coffee boy. 
Nobody else is getting their coffee. People don't want to do that job, though. This is going to be the best coffee they've ever had, <laughs> and then they're going to ask me to do a report. And it's going to be the best report they've ever had. Then they're going to ask me to run a meeting. It's going to be the best meeting they've ever seen. It was like, I'm going to force you to hire me. You're not going to have a choice because when a job opens up, it's going to be that or 15 recruits aren't going to come here. Six recruits aren't going to come here because I was the best at that. It was my mindset was not please hire me or I hope they do. It was they're not going to have a choice. Yeah. And that's how I've always attacked thing is things are force people to do what you want by just doing such a good job and pouring into what you're doing. They don't have a choice. And when you came here, obviously Arizona State does some, you know, there's some NCAA stuff and, and, and all of that. Why did you decide to say, all right, I'm going to weather this, this storm and build this, this up, knowing that there could be some early, you know, some, 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 some rough roads early, but then that there was a bigger payoff at the end? 100%. I mean, to be honest, probably because I didn't know if it would ever, the timing would ever work again. So even though it was in a rough time, even though there was, to be honest, a lot of risk yeah. from a career standpoint, worked my entire life to get to this opportunity to be a head coach and uh, take over something a little bit not at the highest point. Yeah. Uh, it was because I didn't know if I'd get the opportunity again, and I was willing to risk it to go do something that I tr truly believe in. And then the university and the president you know, told me that I'd have enough time that they were going to weather the storm with me and be through it with me yeah. for enough years that I know if I get enough years here, we're going to get it turned. It's just a matter of when that clock turns. Yeah. And it's going to take a little bit of time based off what you just said. Yeah. And so re recruiting has taken a different turn out in the world because of NIL and everything else. What is your philosophy on high school recruiting versus portal at this point in time, but well, now where your roster is and where you hope it'll be in a year, two years from now. Yeah, so obviously, I'm all about roster balance of ages. So when you look at a roster of, let's say, five, five years of ages, including redshirt seniors, okay, you should have 15 to 20 kids in each class. Let's say 15, just keep the number simple. So I want to keep that number balanced amongst the classes. So if that means that we showed up and we had no upperclassmen, we were missing juniors and seniors and we have five of them, we need to go to the portal to sign juniors and seniors. Okay. Uh, if, and we had to do that because we were lacking the upper class. Because without the upper class, you lack a little bit of leadership. So you need that roster balance still. On the contrary, people try to put portal kids in a box as if it's a bad thing. Like, yeah. oh, are you gonna stop recruiting high school? It's just the portal. And it drives me nuts because what if that kid, we signed Cole Martin who was a top 200 player, four star from right up the road, yep. who's a, a freshman. Yeah. He's a freshman, but he's rolled as a portal kid. Yeah. To me, that's a freshman. Yeah, that's a freshman. That's filling that class. Okay. So I look at it, I don't care portal, high school, none of that matters to me. It's where is your age versus where do you fit in terms of what ages of kids on the roster do we need? Now that we're balanced, I would hope that, you know, we're in the portal gets us above and beyond, whereas the portal is difference makers, not depth. Yeah. That's yeah. where I would yeah, like to I get really, to. Like, I, I, I look at some places, and there there's a difference to me initially versus where you got to go long term. And I look at the, like, I don't believe that you can build a real contender, like a real, real winning program exclusively or the majority of your players going through the uh, portal that you especially linemen they got to come through high high school so what what's your philosophy on or what do you tell the younger guys because there are the the, the numbers say there there are less players being signed do you from high school do you think that will correct itself or do you think that this is where we are right now i think it's kind of where we are right now because there's some teams can mitigate risk by going to the portal. They can say, we have a proven commodity yeah. that we can get. Why would we sign the high school kid? Yeah. So there's that, but then you can't ruin your culture. So like you said, there's a balance. So I think it is a changing of the guards a little bit, which teams won't sign uh, quite as many high school kids. Yeah. Uh, but that's just the, the nature of the beast right now with the current rules that are in place today. Yeah. That could change. You know, a big reason that changed was they, 
opened up the 25 limit to everybody now. Yeah. So there used to be a 25 cap. If that was still a cap, you'd see a lot more high school kids being signed, right? With the changing of the cap, allows your own roster to leave more, yeah. allows you to go recruit more portal kids, and it just kind of changes the game a little bit. So I think that question is a, to me, it's a temporary answer because it could change with the changing of a rule. Yeah. Tomorrow. So yes, to answer your question, I think high school is the way to go still and supplement with the portal. Yeah. But you have to get to that point where you feel good and balanced with your roster. Then you have to maintain your roster. Because even if you want to sign high school kids, if 14 seniors or juniors choose to transfer, you have to go replace them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because if your roster is too young, then it creates a whole different set. Of um, imagine if you're a D lineman and you get beat out by another freshman. Not a good dynamic with nope. the portal. So yeah, you signed a whole bunch of high school kits, but if you sign too many, now they stack each other. Now one gets beat out, the other transfers. Did you really sign them all? Yeah. Now your rosters. Where do you still got to go? That's why I'm all about roster balance. So if a junior beats out a sophomore or a freshman, I can still say, listen, you love it here. Yeah. Develop. Yeah. But if you stack too many then you're going to create more transfers, which then create your problem you started to begin with. So I'm all about equaling the roster. Hopefully that just happens like it used to. And then you supplement four to five transfers a year that come in and out. But who knows where the rules will go and where it will change. Yeah, and you told me that that's your plan at quarterback, too, yep. is like not to take a – because – if evaluation is important, yep. you know, and that you you wanted to take take a high school kid every other year to you know to help keep the roster balanced and and everything like that, which I think is a great idea. Um, but you've been around two quarterbacks that are headed into the draft now, um, Bo Nix, who you were around at Oregon, and then at um, um, well at Auburn, and then at Oregon. Um, when did you know that Bo Nix was going to be good? Because well, well first. Did you have a hand in getting him up there to Eugene? And did you know that he was going to be that good? Yeah, definitely had a hand in getting him to Eugene. Obviously, we had a great relationship. I mean, he was the SEC Newcomer of the Year at Auburn, uh, the one year we were together at Auburn. And uh, I knew he was good at the moment he stepped on campus Yeah, uh, at Auburn. I knew he was a special player, special mindset. Sometimes timing and things work out and everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And uh, that reason got him to Eugene. But uh, I knew pretty early that this was a special player because he had a special mindset. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is... Well, so then he didn't have a ton of success at, at, at Auburn. Like, he, he had flashes and m moments. But at what point in time, like, when you guys got there to Eugene, what, what changed? Was, was, it, was it the coaching? Was it the, what, what changed? I mean, I think, one, uh, you know, he had an interest. His dad went to Auburn. He yeah. was at Auburn. You know, they were going through some difficult times as a, as a university from, a, you know, coaching changes and stuff like that for him. He hadn't had the same coordinator his entire career. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of change. Whereas at Auburn, I just felt like he's so hard on himself because he's a perfectionist. If I told him that his pinky's not strong and that's why his ball is, is in a spiral every time, you're going to see that dude <laughs> with, like, pinky weights. That's how he operates. Yeah. That's his mindset. So to me, it was – really less the physical and the football stuff, and it was more getting him to be happy, relax, and play the game, Yeah, like free, and not have that pressure on him, on him, which he can handle pressure, but it was more like, be comfortable in yourself. You're super talented. And, uh, you know, the more comfortable he got, uh, and the more freedom he had in the offense because he's so smart, if you put handcuffs on a kid like that, and he takes the snap, and he's like, I don't like this play. I don't like the answer I have here, but I have to do it. Now you're uncomfortable. You're thinking about the wrong thing. It was, no, take the handcuffs off of them. I trust you. Go win football games. I'm going to teach you so we're on the same page. If you see this look, check to this. If you see this look, check to that. I don't give a crap. As long as you can tell me after the play why you did it and there was a reason, go play the game. Yeah. And he did that. And I think that's really what set him, I say, free is he played the game free and he had fun because of it. That makes sense. Now – Tell me about Jordan Travis, because just like 
Bo Nix, early in his career, had some struggles and, you know, fans weren't great with him. But now he's a, he's a legend <laughs> at Florida State. Um, what, what was that time with, with him like? It was awesome. I mean, the first meeting we had, he said, I'm not a quarterback, but I can play wide out or running back or whatever. That was my first meeting with him. I'm like, golly, that was interesting. Yeah. That was my thought. And then I went and saw him throw out there. I wasn't even coaching it. I just watched him throw, and I'm like, damn. This kid, like, has some tools. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just working with him, he just needed to people to believe in him. Yeah. And nothing like I tell people all the time, like, I didn't, I'm not some magical coach. Like, I don't, whoa, Kenny Dillingham coaches you. You become great. That's yeah. not how that works. But I am good with people. And they're both different people. And it's like, okay, well, what? Jordan just needed somebody to believe in him passionately yeah. and show it because he had doubts that how good he was yeah. because just the college profession that dynamics tear it out of you so I mean there was a time where I couldn't convince him he was good so I gave up and I told all of our quarterbacks to start booing him every throw an individual start so instead of saying how great he is we, we, we flipped it on him we're like you suck you suck you can't throw good luck nice miss like Every day, you can ask, oh, you can ask Chubba Purdy, Tate Rodemaker. I, I mandated it. Every throw, tell him how bad he sucks. Because I wanted him to realize, like, would we really tell a player he sucked that he sucked? Yeah. No. So, and he finally was, it became a game. But it was all to show him, like, man, you got this. You're a special talent. You got it. And it finally clicked. And when it clicked for him, I got out of his way. <laughs> get out of here. When it clicks for a quarterback, I, I run the opposite direction. I educate him, but I get out of the way. Let him roll. Man, that's dope. So you you are here at Arizona State. Why Arizona State for all the recruits that are sitting out there, for all the kids that are uh, are making their college choices, and they're saying, "Man, where should I where should I go? I like this Kenny Dillingham guy. I like the staff. Why Arizona State? Because if a big group of people came here and did something that's never been done, you'll be remembered forever. Doing something that's been done before doesn't make you remembered. Yeah. Just makes you part of the book instead of the cover. At ASU, you can literally be the cover of a book in one of the top five fastest growing cities. So not only can you build a brand in a city that's growing, when you graduate from here, you can live here like all the people do when they retire. You can live right next to Donovan McNabb, who lives 20 minutes from here when he retired. I don't even know Donovan McNabb, he's just around all the time. You can retire here, you can use your name that you built, and you can make yourself more successful than you would have been going to a place and then leaving that town when you graduate. Use the city, use it. I tell people all the time, it's not just coming to college. It's not just the football. Use the city. If you go on to play in the NFL, great. What are you going to do then? You're going to come right back to Arizona State where people from the league retire. And you're going to pour into the city and open a car dealership with your name on it. And nobody's going to go there because they know who you are. Don't just think four years, oh, where's the quickest place I can go? Do something that's never been done, ever. And if you do that, you'll be remembered forever. Man, so, but... Uh but uh, coach, uh, recruiting is hard because it's the transfer world <laughs> and everything else. And you know, I I, I have made fun of coaches, and, and it was re refreshing to hear you say it because I have a lot of friends in the coaching pr profession. I'm like, especially head coaches. I'm like, listen, you are a multimillionaire. <laughs> you are paid the big bucks to to deal with the hard stuff. What gave you that mentality? to say, yes, the transfer portal is hard. Yes, NIL is hard. Yes, you, you know, roster management is hard, but I am going to take this by the reins and embrace it. Helps the players, bottom line. I got into this profession trying to, I enjoy seeing kids get better. So like I enjoy coaching freshman football. Like I told my wife, when I retire, I'm gonna go coach freshman football or eighth graders. Like that's what I wanna do. So anything that helps the player, what are you doing? If you disagree with something that helps the player, like in any way, shape, or form, then what are you doing? Are you really in it for the right reason? Yeah. And yeah, does it make our job way more difficult? Yes, but what it also does is it makes you have to be more honest with these guys. It forces you to, because they can transfer. You can't give the sales pitch and sell the dream anymore. 
and then say you're stuck here and then treat them poorly. Yeah. You actually have to treat kids well. You have to treat them with respect how they should have always been treated. Yeah. So the some people, the game is changing. You have to treat kids well. Treat these guys with respect. You have to show that you can actually teach them, coach them, care about them, and all of that stuff that, in my opinion, is that like high school coaching me of like, people say it's all about the money now. Yeah, that's important. That's important. Yeah. But the relationships more than ever now, you double down on because if that kid knows you care about him, like we mentioned off air, is he going to leave for 40 grand? If he truly knows that I got a guy who if I'm in trouble on a Friday night and I'm out there and I don't know what to do, I can call my head coach and he will help me. That's what we got here. See, that's dope, man. Um, last, last question for you before we get to right or wrong. I have enjoyed, you know, watching coaches that I know, like the younger ones especially, like grow and guys that I played with. Um, what? Did, how are you embracing the the alumni, like the like the guys that were here that you were watching? Yeah. Prior to, to to getting here, who are now alumni, who are living in the in in the city, are they welcome back in the program? Yes. Yeah, so every single practice is open to our alumni. They can come to any practice, any meeting, game day. We line the field. All of them can line the field. Um, do I got to do a better job? getting more people involved after my first year, that's a self-reflection. I gotta get more of them there. It's available and open, but have I educated people on it enough? Probably not, because why aren't we having some of these guys that have played here show up more and be more passionate about the place? And it's my fault. I gotta find a way to get those guys and those alumni back involved, even though it's available and it's open. Well, if we're not doing it, then you can't look elsewhere, it's internal. I gotta fix something, where's the change? So yes, it's open, yes, it's available, yes, I want it, but I gotta do a better job going to engage and get guys here. So give me a message to the Sun Devil faithful, whether it's about NIL, whether it's about recruiting, whether it's about the uh, city. So you talked about the things that you can do better. What what can how can the city, the the fan base be more involved and help you do a better job? I would say butts in seats and support the program any way you can through NIL. Those are the two ways we get good players. You get good players from atmospheres, right? From a fan perspective. The atmosphere you create, does it sold out? When they come in, is that thing rocking? Right? And then can you get in the game financially through NIL? So that's what I would ask is, if you can't give to NIL, just get in the stadium. Show up. Be really loud. Know a kid's name and chant his name when he walks into the stadium because you're recruiting him. Yeah. Like, know it somehow. Know it. Study it. Study it before the game and be like, oh, that guy. Study it before the game, and if you run into him, say, oh, I remember you. I'll never forget a kid I was recruiting went to go visit another school. I was here at the time, five-star kid, and he goes, man, I love it here, Coach, but when I went and visited school blank, there was like five random people that walked up to me, knew my name, and shook my hand. Yeah. I felt like a celebrity. Like, that is what this Valley can do if everybody just does your part. If you can give money, give money. If you can buy tickets, buy tickets. If you can't do either, learn people's name and walk around Mill Avenue when it's recruiting season or go to a, a high school game out here with a baller and go say, go to ASU, random dude. That has an impact. Everybody can help. Find your avenue and maximize it. Let's go! <laughs> Where's my letter? Man, where's my letter? Yo. I, when you interview people, this is a little bit of but behind the scenes. You get an energy. This man has energy, and when he said he's good with, with, with people, I was like, man, this is, like, I feel it. I feel it. I believe it. I believe that you want to be here, and I know that you guys are going to do a great job. You guys, he's Kenny Dillingham. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. All right, thanks.